All right, if you have your Bibles, turn me to uh, John chapter 8. John chapter 8. When you're laid up sick and you're not busy running around and running to hospitals and doing all this other stuff, you got a lot of time to ponder and think. you also got a lot of time to go through all their emails and stuff and messages. And, and uh, one of the messages that I got, somebody said, uh, so, and it's crazy, crazy, two different people. So you need to listen to this song. You, you can do this in church. So I listen to this song. This, this, this artist, I had no idea who it was and everything. And I listened to it, and I, I thought, that is not a song I would ever do in church. Uh, highly unbiblical, you know, and uh, not, it, it was horrible, really. And the person that sent me is not in here, so I can say that. I'm praying for you. You thought that was a good song to sing in church. Because it was not. It was not good at all. And then uh, somebody else, somebody else sent me a message with this video with this guy that is, boy, just trying to decimate Christianity. Trying to decimate Christ. And just against everything. And, and, uh, and you can tell that the guy had, had some, he's, he's been in church. He knows some church stuff. He knows some of the stories. But he doesn't know all the stories. And it's got, I, you, it, I didn't know who it was. You may know who is a pretty popular country guy, Jelly Roll. You know who this guy is? Yeah. Big old, he's a big feller. Yeah, and, and his, uh, I mean, excuse me for saying, but his wife, I guess, looked like she stepped right off, right off of a stripper pole. I mean, it's, it's pretty, woo, you know, wow. And uh, pretty shocked and, shocked and amazed, but very popular guy, right? Some of y'all know, know who that is. I didn't have a clue. And, and talented, right? But he, he gets on this interview and he's blasting the church. And he's blasting Jesus. And said, if they really knew who Jesus was, they wouldn't be doing X, Y, G. And some of the stuff he's right. Because the church has taken Jesus and used him as a weapon. The church has. How many, how many of you ever been church hurt before? Did the what? Church hurt. Church hurt. Got, got hurt at church. You know why? Nobody raised their hand because most people that still attended church aren't didn't get church hurt. Those people aren't here, right? Because somebody said something that they shouldn't have said. Now sometimes there is biblical correction. There is showing love by correcting others, and people get hurt and offended and they leave. But there is uh, the opposite side of that. People using using the Bible like a billy club to beat people over the head with it. You know, that we need to do that to the devil. You take God's word the same way Jesus did. And said, and Jesus said, it is written, man shall I live. All right? So that, that, this, this weapon is for the devil. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. That person, whoever said that thing or offended you or anything else, that's not your enemy. The devil behind that guy is your enemy, Right? Even if it was your enemy, what's the Bible tell us to do with our enemies? You feed them. You clothe them. Clothe them. You love them. You give them to drink. You know, you know the story of the Good Samaritan and everything. But, uh, so what I, what I want to talk about is what this guy had did. It's the same thing that all of us have did in one shape, some shape, way, shape, or form, or another, some other time. We have done the exact same thing that he did. Committed idolatry. Taking, taking the Jesus of the Bible and cutting off the parts that we don't like. Cutting off the parts that we're not comfortable with. Cutting, cutting off the parts that may step on our toes and cause offense. Bring conviction. Because the, the parts that maybe require us to change. We cut off those parts to hold on to the parts that we like. How many of us have ever did that? Yeah? We've all did it. Some way, shape, or form, we are all guilty of committing idolatry is making a God in our image instead of us conforming to the image of God. You know, it says in the, in the beginning of, they say that in the, in the beginning, God created man. And then after that, man has been trying to create God ever since. 
So, uh, so this guy, he, he, uh, he committed idolatry. How did, how did he commit idolatry? Well, he took, took that Jesus, shaved off the bits he didn't like, or maybe, the, maybe he wasn't even told right. But the problem is he, he's very popular, and a whole generation is listening to him and what he's got to say about Jesus, and it's very one-sided. A very one-sided Jesus, we call it a greasy grace Jesus, right? Is this Jesus over here that the, uh, the phrase is, uh, you know, when, uh, when God looks at you, he doesn't see your sin, he sees the sun. And when God looks at the sun, he sees your sin. And so you can just do whatever you want. You have no accountability. You can just sit all you want and God doesn't see it anymore. It's as if God just puts some blinders on and doesn't care that you sin anymore. Doesn't care that you serve him. You can just do 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 just go do whatever you want without a ounce of grief or conviction. That's a greasy grace Jesus that's over here. Right? Now on the other side, that greasy grace Jesus is is the one where, you know, God's just a he's an angry father. He's just waiting for you to step one little bit out of line. He's gonna pop you down. All, the, all God wants to do is send you to hell. You know, that, that uh, condemnation, Jesus. This, this is all he's about. It's fire and brimstone, hard hitting, hard hitting, hard hitting. You know, either side of this, if you're full on, full on on this side, that's idolatry. If you're full on on this side, that's idolatry. Where's the true biblical Jesus? Does, does, does Jesus have grace and mercy and love? And compassion? Is he familiar with you? Does he know you? Yes. Is Jesus going to come back and punish sin? Yes. Is, 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 we read it last week, I think, 2 Thessalonians 1. says he's coming back to wreak vengeance upon those that know not God and do not obey him. So is that the biblical Jesus? Yes. So it, it's, it's not either, either extreme is idolatry. Either extreme is idolatry. The true biblical Jesus lands in the middle. It's not an either or. It's an and also. Right? Right? So we have to be, be very careful on where we, what part of the line do we put our Jesus in. Some people are a lot more over here. Some people are a lot more over there. You know, today, I don't know. I'm, 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 I'm pretty uh, certain about the fear of God, you know, and and I know where, where I stand with him, and that puts fear in my heart. It draws me closer to him. Right? So, so if you're on this side and you, and you see no guilt or conviction of your sin, you're on the wrong side. That's a different Jesus. And if you turn on me, I hope you're spot, John, if you're there. But uh, turn on me to 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 4. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom you have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which you have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. And so there, there's going to be people coming, going to be doing, doing three things. They're going to be preaching another Jesus that is not the biblical Jesus. They're going to be bringing another spirit that is not the Holy Spirit of the Bible. And what's the third thing? I just drew blank. And another gospel. Another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel. Some, may, some people are going to be doing that. And I think if you look at the American church as a general and in a whole, they've done that. Now what that guy, that jelly roll, was saying in that video, part of that's true. But not the way he says it. Because a lot of the... the uh, uh, we call American churchianity is leaned way over into this. It's, it's all about health, wealth, and prosperity. You know, what can God do for me instead of what he's already done for you? Is it like, well, my God died, died so I can be rich and wrong. My God died so I can be healthy. Uh, no, that's not it either. That's, that's, that's a different Jesus. That's a different gospel, and it comes from a different spirit, right? So it's warning you. He's warning that these things will, will happen, and what happens when, when it does happen? So don't bear it. Don't put up with it. 
Get rid of it. If it, I don't care if it's your favorite TV preacher. Click. Shut it off. Listen to somebody else. Find somebody that's biblical. Shut it off. Now, it, it, turn with me over to uh, Galatians 1. A couple pages to the right. Galatians 1. Verse 6. Paul says, I marvel that you are so soon removed. What's that? Removed. How do you get removed? I removed that mic stand and put it over there. Removed. You are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Paul says, I'm amazed. I marvel. I, I, I am just blown away that you would so easily and so soon be pulled away to a different gospel. Right? You know, if, if it's not the Spirit of God, it's not the gospel of God, and it's not the Son of God, is there salvation in any, any of that? Is, is there salvation in this idol of the Jesus that is not the biblical Jesus? No. No, you got to have the whole Jesus. You got to have the right Jesus. Amen. Amen. You got to you be on the right side of things. Now I know I've, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. For some of y'all that haven't been here, they say, "George, have you met my friend Bob?" And Bob, Jim said, "Yeah, I know Bob." Said, uh, you, "We talk about the same Bob. Bob about six foot tall." Said, yeah, Bob's about six foot tall. But uh, your Bob wearing glasses? Yeah, yeah, he wears glasses. You live on D Street? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, is, uh, is he black? Uh, no. Bob, I know white. For a strand, you pick some coming out. <laughs> they said, well, well, the Bob I know is black, and he lives over there six foot tall, wears glasses. But he says, the Bob I know is white, wears glasses six foot tall. Are we talking about the same Bob? No. Take one characteristic so away from the biblical Jesus, you're not talking about the same Jesus. You're talking about a different Jesus. In the same way, we're not talking about the same Bob. He's different. He's different. Now turn with me back to uh, Matthew 24. Matthew 24. I love Matthew 24. You know, Matthew 24 is talking about all about end time stuff. And we've been talking about end time stuff ever since we started. I mean, for months. Loving it. Well, I just have, God have to keep going back to it? I, God knows. God knows. But I've got an unction in my heart talking about this stuff. And, uh, they, you know, we're one day closer to Jesus coming back than we was yesterday. Be ready. Be ready. Be ready. Matthew 24, verse 24 says, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible they shall deceive the very elect. What, what's he warning? In the latter days, in the end times, there shall be false Christs and false prophets insomuch if possible deceive the very elect. What should we be watching out for? What should we be? If it says this is coming, we should be on guard. If it says this is coming, this is what we should be looking for. If, if the Bible says it, the, you know, the Bible has more prophecies that are prophesied that have yet to happen yet. You know, there's not, not one prophecy from God in here that won't happen. If it says it's going to happen, it's going to happen, right? Over 500 prophecies prophesied about Jesus when he was coming the first round. And he fulfilled everyone perfectly. If he didn't, it wouldn't be the Messiah. It wouldn't be Jesus. It'd be another Jesus. So he fulfilled them all. In the same way, all these prophecies he's talking about, there's going to be false Christ and false prophets. How do we know? The Bible says so. Should we be looking out? Yes, we should be looking out. Because they are everywhere. It says don't be deceived. Why? Because people will be deceived. So part of this, you can turn back to John 8 now, where, we, where I was going to start and sidetrack just a little bit. But, but uh, 
part of this, why I'm saying all this, false Christ. What is false Christ? Just say, here's, here's a Jesus. I'm going to chisel off and cut off everything I'm not comfortable with so he looks more like me. So he doesn't step on my toes. So it, it's something that I'm okay. And he's okay with me. Right? That's idolatry. That's, that's exactly what this, this gay who did. Cutting down Christianity, taking the Jesus that's not the Jesus of the Bible, and giving half truths. What the devil do? The exact same thing. Let's take a, let's take a truth and just take shave off a little bit and replace it with a lie. Right? Need the whole truth, nothing but truth, so help you God. Amen. So one of the one of the stories this guy uses. To talk about these half truths is in chapter 8 of John, one of my most favorite stories. In uh, verse 1, it said, Jesus went into the Mount of Olives. Okay, we have people that have been there, right? You guys do? Yeah. Anybody else been to Jerusalem? Oh, oh. Gosh. I'm not supposed to be jealous, but I'm jealous. <laughs> so Jesus went into the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning, he came again into the temple. And all the people came unto him. I said, it says all. He's got a crowd, right? All the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. Right? Now, what's the, so he's in the temple, and, and if you look over at, uh, at verse 20, St. Jacob, it says where he's at in the temple. He's in the treasury. So that's an odd place to be preaching from, Jesus. But uh, he's in the temple in the treasury. What is the floor of the temple made of? Stone, right? Right? And it's being walked on, right? So what's what is a good possibility? What is on top of the stone? Dirt, mud, stuff, people falling off the sandals and, and everything else. And, and and I think that's probably the way it is now, right? There's there's stone and there's it's covered with a layer of silt, right? From people walking on it, carry carrying stuff out. And we, uh, how many of y'all saw when it was in Mexico? We almost didn't get back over because they said, you gotta clean the mud off. Why? Because it's got bacteria and stuff. I said, oh, well, you know, I didn't think about that. When you're driving through all the, the mud and the junk and everything over there, the uh, something happens to the septics when it rains a lot. It comes up. So this is not just water, that, it's not just mud that you're walking through. It's, it, 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 it. <laughs> yeah, I didn't wear the same boots, you know, just saying. <laughs> but but, but what, once he said, I thought they were joking with us. You know, it's, oh, I fall on my legs. and no, we're serious. You know, I can make you turn around and go wash that off. So, oh, okay. Because they don't bring that uh, Mexican bacteria over here. Okay, I understand. But uh, so, so you think about Jesus is, for once, sitting down. On people's dirt, right? Sitting down. You imagine? I'm, my knees are. I'm not getting down there. Imagine Jesus sitting down. Did did they have folding chairs back then? No, no pews. No, they, you know, they, they were sitting on the ground. Everybody's sitting on the ground. Jesus sat down and taught two times in Scripture. At all times he taught. Twice it says he sat down and he taught. Then now the other times doesn't say that he sat down. It doesn't say he stood. So he could have been standing. Could have been sitting. It doesn't say. So he's sitting down to teach. And all of these people came unto him. And then verse 3. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery when they had set her in the midst. What are they doing? He's sitting there teaching. Plopped her right down the midst of it. You think about what this woman's going through. Put yourself in her position. Think of the embarrassment that she's facing, they say caught in the act of adultery. But that's that's sex outside of marriage, right? You know, we don't have to have a class on that, right? We know what that is. So she's caught in the act of adultery. She may not have clothes on. And did they wrap her up in a sheet or something? We don't know. But for sure she's embarrassed. She got caught for, for, for two. I don't know that she would have went very willingly knowing what was in store for her, right? Would you? If somebody was fixing to take you out and stone you, would you go silently? Probably not. And then, and then, so she's probably maybe a little injured, and then 
she knows what's in store. She's going to what could be her death, right? So they, they put her in the midst of her, interrupting his teaching, verse 4, and they said unto him, Master, well, they got that part right. That's about the only thing that they got right. They called him Master. This woman was taken in adultery in the very act. In the very act. Now, what is, what is, what is adultery, right? Takes two to tango, right? So look at, uh, turn with me to Leviticus 20. Leviticus 20, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, way back in the Old Testament. Leviticus, the Levites, Leviticus 20. Verse 10. Now, now, now to, to back up a little bit, Leviticus 20 has got a, lot, a whole lot more stuff in there than just this. Does not just talk about adultery. It starts off talking about those that are sacrificing their babies at the altar of Molech, sacrificing their children. And we see we see it through this whole chapter. We see parallels today, right? Uh, in the in the U.S., on average, 2,400 babies are killed. Due to abortion, due to the God, the God of convenience, this here says if you if you offered up your child to Molech, you're gonna be stoked to death, right? And then it goes on to say if you knew that your neighbor or your loved one or your friend was going to do this, you get the same punishment. So if you know somebody doing it, you better warn them, or else you're going to get the same punishment they are. 2,400 a day in the U.S. You think about that. that babies, innocent babies, <coughs> sacrificed in the name of convenience in the U.S. And that's not counting California and New York. They don't have to report their numbers. Sick, what we do in this country, right? And then and it goes on in verse 6, it says, The soul that turns after such as have familiar spirits and after wizards. The, so it, there it's talking about familiar spirits, wizards, witchcraft, sorcerers. It goes on talking about, about that. So what do you do with those people? You stone them too. You know what the, the number one best-selling book to children has been for the past few years? Harry Potter. Yeah, let's, let's just celebrate. Let's teach our kids how to, how to practice witchcraft because it's in there. The real deal. It's not a game. And then, and then of course, if you, if you look over at uh, in verse 13, if a man lie with mankind as he lies with a woman, both of them committed an abomination. That's what should be put to death. Their blood should be upon them. What's that do? So you got homosexuality, homosexuality in there too. Everything that we see plaguing our world and our country, well, it's right there. It's right there. It's, it's plain to date and obvious. And uh, another thing, the, the number one, who do you think the number one creator and exporter of pornography is? The United States. Welcome to a good Christian nation who kills our young, celebrates homosexuality, and wizards and witchcraft and sorcery and pornography. Every sin on the man, just about. So back to verse 10. It says, And the man, and the what? What does it say? No, and the man. man, right? And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Pretty plain and simple, right? This is the Levitical law. This is the law by which they were abiding by. Now, it doesn't say specifically, you know, from, from verse 7 all the way up to verse 25 or so. It doesn't say how these are supposed to be put to death. We're just assuming that it's stoning, right? So back to John, he says... Verse 4 said, they say to him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. What are we missing? The man. Where's the man? They caught him in the act. Did he get away? 
Did they already stone him to death? Didn't mean there's all kinds of questions you can ask, ask, why is there not a man here? Why are they not being stoned together? It does not say. So we do not know. So then, so verse 5, it says, Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. Not exactly. It doesn't say that it just says killed. But Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him. Right? Why? Because they want to. They want him to be stoned, right? And, and the crazy thing is, if you, if you look up to, uh, where, do, 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 do. ah, I lost it. Same chapter. Verse 59, the last verse, same chapter. They took up stones to, stop, to cast at him, and Jesus hid himself and went throughout the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. That's an awesome verse. They took up stones to stone Jesus. Jesus had just dealt with this, with this adulterous woman, and then and at the end of the story, he's in the temple. Now those same stones are getting ready to be thrown at Jesus, and he passes through. He hides himself. That's so cool. That's so cool. So back, so back to the story. Moses in the law commanded us that such be stoned. But what sayest thou? Verse 6. This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stood down with his finger, wrote on the ground, as though he heard them not. So Jesus, sitting in the ground, sitting on the stone that's covered in dirt, right? Because you can't just write on stone unless you're God. When, when, when do we see the last time the finger of God writing on stone? Writing these commandments that says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. So in the same instance, here he is, stooped down, writing on the stone in the dirt, as if he heard them not. Flat out ignoring him. Say, I'm going back to teaching here. What, what's right in front of him? The woman sit down on this. You think she's standing proudly and just waiting to be stoned? Or is, is she down on the ground? Is she in her embarrassment and guilt and shame? She's down there, right there in the view of Jesus, and he ignores them to get right back to what he was doing. As though he heard them not. I'm just going to keep on going. Wonder what Jesus was teaching them. I don't know. So then. So he wrote with his finger, wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. Verse 7. So when he continued ask, when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, This is the part that Jelly Roll doesn't like. Right? He that is without sin cast the first stone. He that is without sin cast the first stone. He's down. He's in the midst with the woman, riding on the ground. They keep pestering him. What he's trying to convey, I don't know. But then he's, he raises himself up, says, he's without sin, cast the first stone. And then what's he do? Verse 8. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Said what he needed to say and gets right back to what he was doing. Now he's got a multitude of people around him, right? In verse 9, they which heard it. Now here's the kicker. All my life I was raised up about what he wrote on the ground, and that's why everybody left. He wrote something. He wrote all their sins out on the ground. Or he wrote, he wrote the commandments, you know, or, or something. It doesn't say that he, they left because of what he wrote. He says, and they which heard it, what did they hear? He that was without sin cast the first stone. They which heard it being convicted by their own conscience. You know what conscience means? Con, with, science, knowledge. Convicted by their own knowledge of their own sinfulness, of their own wickedness. Dropped the rock and left. They went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even to the last 
even to the last, that means nobody else was there, and Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. They went out one by one, the eldest to the youngest. Why did, they, why did the eldest go first? We can presume who has more sin. Right? Some of y'all are older, you know. <laughs> they went out eldest to the youngest. I, and I would assume that's probably why. They went out the, and they were, they were all gone. And, and I, using my imagination, okay, I'm thinking once they felt that conviction, they probably dropped what was in their hands. Now imagine if, you, if, if that's what happened, if you're that woman, you're down there, guilt, shame, and you hear rocks drop, one after another, after another, after another. And then, it, and then it says, and there she was, what? The woman, Jesus was left alone with the woman standing in the midst. Standing in the midst. I think she's pretty at all in amazement. This is not this is not a follower of Jesus. This is not somebody that that you know it she's not groveling at his feet. She didn't even call him Lord or Master. She didn't say she didn't come in and say, Lord, forgive me. I've sinned a great sin. She didn't she didn't say none of that. But the one now the woman's standing. In verse 10, when Jesus had lifted himself up, so Jesus is still down. She's now standing. Jesus lifted himself up and saw none but the woman. He said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Had no man condemned thee? Where did they all go? Hey, woman. Where did all those rock carrying people go? They're fixing, fixing to take your life. Where did they all go? Did Jesus know where they went? Oh, yeah. He wants her to recognize where they went and why they went because they were convicted of their own sin. And in verse 11, she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Now, see, Jesus said, What did he say? He says, Let him who is without sin cast the first stone. Who is the only one there in the midst that has every right, every opportunity, and every possibility to take up a real rock and stone this woman? Jesus does. Yet he doesn't. Yet he doesn't. He chooses to, to walk and show mercy. It's not even asked for. He chooses to show grace where it's not really deserved. And he chooses to do the same thing with us. Every single day, we're the woman. Every single day, we don't deserve the forgiveness that he's giving her. Every single day, we may be the ones holding the rock, ready to chuck it and whoever slips up in our eyes. But Jesus has designed this situation, you think this took him by surprise? No, he knew it was coming. He knew what was happening. He knew what was coming down the pipe. Now the 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 idolatrous part of that of this story is that a lot of people abide by is well Jesus is just hanging out with this this woman is adulterous. She could be a prostitute or something. We don't know, but but Jesus is just hanging out. He just forgave her and and just let her go on her way. And, and in, in this picture, the, the self-righteous church people are the ones holding the rocks. Right? Did Jesus forgive her? Absolutely. Absolutely. But it didn't stop there. He didn't say and give her a little pat on the back. So, all right, go back. You know, call everybody back in. You get out of here. And, you know, I got to finish my teaching. He didn't. He didn't do any of that. What did he say? She said, "No man, Lord." And Jesus said unto her, "Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Don't go back and do what you're just doing. 
Don't go back into the same lifestyle that you're living. Don't go back to that a great love and great mercy and great forgiveness comes a great responsibility. Don't go back and do what you've done. Don't continue to do what you know Jesus died for. And don't take pleasure in, in what his blood was still for. Go and sin no more. You know, that's not the only time Jesus says that. Well, he doesn't really mean that. That's not what he means. You know, well, that's exactly what he means. This is, this is finding the middle ground of Jesus. It's not just the idolatry that he'd forgive her and let her go on her way. And it's not that Jesus put up a stone to stone him himself. And said, okay, you're forgiven. I don't condemn you. Now go and sin no more. He says that to another to another guy and that uh, was blind, and Jesus healed him. And he says, now go and sin no more, or a worse thing will come upon you. Does, does God expect our belief to result in change? Does God expect when we experience his forgiveness and that burden of sin and guilt and shame, just like this woman, when that, we get free of that, does he respect us to respond in kind? Absolutely. Absolutely he does. But we can commit an idolatry and, and forget that part and not focus on that part. We like the rose-colored glasses, hippie Jesus, you know, the white Jesus with blue eyes. It's not, he didn't look like that. So what's, what's those Pharisees and scribes were given the knowledge? They dropped the rock and left and eventually picked it back up again to stone Jesus. Now you look, look at the next page over here, John uh, eight twenty three. Jesus talking to them. He said unto them, "You are from beneath. I'm from above. You're of this world, and I'm not of this world." And he said unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am He, ye shall die in your sins. Well, Jesus, that's not very nice. That, that, you're not going to win friends and influence people talking like that, Jesus. You know, Jesus fashioned a whip and whipped people in the temple for making merchandise of his father's house. It says he was angry and he had a cause. You made my father's house a den of thieves. Now, you know, look over to uh, John 8, 34. John 8, 34, Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin, committeth sin as a servant of sin. Ouch, Jesus. That doesn't give me warm, fuzzy feelings inside. Verse 35, And the servant abides not in the house forever, but the son abides forever. If the son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Whew, that's a good verse. Free of what? Sin, shame, guilt, regret. Amen? Look at verse 44. Same, same book, same chapter. I'm not going all over the place. Hey, he's, he's talking to the Pharisees and Sadducees and says, You wrote your father the devil. That's not very nice, Jesus. If I was Jesus, I wouldn't say that. I'd be nicer than that. Don't commit idolatry. Don't commit idolatry. And, and, and on another point, watching uh, TV shows and movies that portray Jesus, you know what that can do? That can build up idolatry in you, and you don't even realize it. Well, I, I like the way that was portrayed, like in The Chosen. Oh, he said, you know, I like the way it's portrayed in there. That's not the biblical Jesus. You know that, right? That's very one sided Jesus. Do you think Jesus had to rehearse the Sermon on the Mount? Uh, no. <laughs> you just go thing after thing after thing. That's, that's a Mormon Jesus. Right? 
That, that's, that's for the most part, that's a, that's a Mormon idea of Jesus and not the God, of, the, the Jesus of the Bible. Hey, look, look at verse 7, or verse 47. He's that it, he that is of God heareth God's word, ye therefore hear them not, because you're not of God. Not nice, Jesus. Not very nice. So you see how easily it is to skip over the parts we don't like. That's, that's where our Jesus sandals to church and not get our toes stepped on. Or the opposite of that. We should be wearing our, our Expose your toes. Don't wear steel toe boots to church. We need our toes stepped on, don't we? I tell you, there's not a time I don't open my Bible and where my toes don't get stepped on. Every day, all day. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus, because he's making me more like him. Right? And if you, if you, it's your idea if Jesus is not convicting you of sin and drawing you closer to him, you've got an idol and not the real Jesus. Amen? Amen? So let's be careful who we listen to. Be careful what we put in our ear, our ear holes and our eye holes and what we're watching and paying attention to. Get our nose in the book. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you so much, Lord. We thank you for your grace and your love and your mercy upon us, Lord, but we also thank you for your conviction. Thank you, Lord, for your correction. And your word says you love those that you correct. And I thank you, Lord, that that is a pretty sure fact to know if we're in you and that we know you is when we're corrected by you. And we love you so much. We thank you for every person here. We pray for those that, that are uh, sick and ailing and recovering, Lord, that you put a healing touch upon their body and you heal them, Lord, in such a way that you get the glory and you, you get the credit for all of it, Lord. We pray, Father God, that... Uh, Continue to, to build our services so people can hear your truth and worship with us and uh, continue to build the family of God that we have here in Park Place. Help us, each and every one of us, to lead a shining example of who you are, Lord. That people will see us and, and not question, but know who it is that we serve. And we thank you and praise you in your precious holy name. Amen and amen. Amen. Okay. Announcements. Wednesday, Bible study, 10 o'clock. Or unless the meeting goes long, we're not a meeting this week. Right? right. It was last week. I missed it. Yeah. Did somebody pray? You pray? Yeah. You pray? Good. We need to keep that prayer in there. Amen? And so uh, 10 o'clock Wednesday, Bible study. Uh, Friday at 11, men's Bible study and women's Bible study. Where's the women's Bible study? Video room, the DVD room, the men's room, the craft room. room. That's right. And uh, so please, please come. I mean, uh, I've been, I've been uh, what, two weeks now building up. I'm about ready to explode. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, please, please come and join us. Try it out. We'll, we'll see. You know, we all, we're all open to learn. You never know. You may be able to teach us something by your input, right? Because every one of us have a piece of the puzzle, right? Amen? Amen. 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 All right, now back to back to church business. We have uh, Dana stepping down off the board, and Liz is accepted to come on the board, right? So we, we open it up to anyone here object to that changing of the guard. Raise your hands. No? No? Okay. Very good. <laughs> Very good. So so the board meeting we'll have right after this will be accepting her in as part of the board. And and Dana has done an amazing job and is always there to, to help. And you'll still be around, right? Yeah, you're not going. <laughs> but uh, and we're very thankful for all the hard work that you've done. So God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And if anybody has any uh, recommendations, any changes, any uh, whatever, you're welcome to give your input in the board meeting or privately to somebody. If, uh, if there's some changes you would like to make, uh, if you'd rather me wear a bag on my head, you know, whatever. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, you, everybody's got an opinion. You know what they say about that, right? So uh, we love you all so much.
And thank you so much. God bless you. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.